Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all are at best of your health. I'm Uskan from third year. Extend a cordial welcome to the speaker of the day, architect Kinjan Shah, who will be comprehending the role of design studios in shaping an architect. I invite our principal professor, Shailesh Nair, to welcome the speaker and all the attendees. Please, sir. Yeah, thank you, Muskan. <clears throat> First of all, let me wish all a happy Eid today. Today on this festival day also, I am happy that all of you are present for this webinar. As far as Kintan is concerned, I don't think he requires any introduction because he is our alumni. He was my student. He was my, I think, the student of the first batch when I started teaching in SVIT. So on behalf of College of Architecture, your college is welcoming you for this webinar. This is the third webinar of our alumni. And I also congratulate Taha and Vignya for uh, arranging this series also. This is alumni series where we promote our alumni to present this webinar so that the students can understand how the role of architecture is there and their experiences after going out of this college. So without sparing much time, let me give the platform to Kintan. Before that, yeah, I think Muskan, anybody is going to speak. Uh, sir, there will be shared a glimpse of our college. Okay. Our college, SVIT Vasat, has come up with various webinar series. And for the second session of the alumni webinar series, we have with us architect Kintan Shah. Kintan Sir is an alumni of SVIT having completed his bachelor's program in architecture in 2012. He has professionally worked at prominent architecture practices like Sanjay Puri Architects, RS, uh, RSP Architecture Consultants, and in, and in various capacities on diverse range of projects. These prepare him to start, a, start and lead his own professional practice in Vadodara. He also keeps keen interest in sharing his experiences, skills, and insights and academic level and was associated with Parallel University for about two years. His areas of interest are sustainable architecture design with focus on climate responsiveness, contextual and eco-sensitive high-rise designs, and evolution of architecture through centuries. Currently, he is pursuing masters in urban, reg urban and regional planning from IIT Roorkee. I request architect Indian Shah to begin with the session. The rostrum is yours, sir. Thank you, Muska. Uh, is my screen visible to all? Yes, yes. Yeah, and I'm audible, right? 
voice in this problem? Yes, Kintan. Okay. Okay. So uh, the title itself speaks a lot about what this talk is going to be about. Uh, it it will uh, you know uh, focus on my love with architecture. Uh, the journey actually started uh, probably around 2005. Uh, when I had cleared off uh, my 10th standard and we had, uh, you know, a scheme of aptitude test. That is when I realized my aptitude towards uh, abstraction and creative thinking. And that brought me to architecture. And that's when the journey began. And uh, I started my graduation uh, in 2007 from SVIT. And that's how it started. So the title cover that you're seeing right now is uh, one of the proposals of Archigram of 1960s. Uh, the title of this particular drawing is uh, the floating city, which is a makeshift kind of a deployable structure meant for exhibitions and temporary uh, you know, events. So this is the group that inspired me while I was a student. You now the way they came up with various concepts and you know original ideas of uh, shaping cities or settlements that would be a better term to use. Uh, it was a group of six individuals, um, uh, English architects, who came together to start a movement that they called they called architect Aki Graham, which. Uh, you know, is derived from architecture and telegram. So it's basically reporting or, you know, uh, criticizing the architecture of those days. And this we are talking about since uh, 1960s. This was, that was the, the time when uh, these six people, they came together and their proposals uh, were like floating city, the walking city, the plug-in cities, very futuristic, which even today, uh, you know, inspire many people and architects around the world. So that is the kind of uh, knowledge that they shared coming together with the world. So uh, that, with that connotation, uh, the first question that I uh, today pose is why architecture? Why do we need architecture? You know, when we start uh, seeing structures that are built in history or, you know, even while moving around the city, uh, each individual has his or her own interpretation and they loudly express their views on what, how things are developing around. So uh, let's first understand why architecture before uh, we get into proper architecture, right? In order to understand architecture, uh, I have a few images just to, uh, you know, uh, make you think on various aspects of design. Uh, so, uh, I, I, it, it's a one way session, so I cannot ask a question, but if anyone could guess what this uh, image is about, then, you know, it could, uh, somebody might say it's a cauliflower or a broccoli or uh, you know, what not. So basically, uh, this is the green cover of an evergreen forest that we see. It's an aerial image taken. If we see from the bottom, this is what you see. right? And then uh, this image talks about one more phenomenon, which is the crown shyness. So basically, it is about a dense forest. When we, uh, you know, when we are in a dense forest, how do they coexist? Trees are also living features. So how do they coexist? So uh, the basic requirement for a tree to grow and survive is light and air. Right. So in order to facilitate light to penetrate within the forest with that dense canopy at the top, they have this phenomenon of crown shyness. When in each uh, uh, foliage of each tree, is separated from each other, there is some gap left in between for light and air to pass through. Right. So uh, this image also, uh, you know, made me think about the current situation that we are in too, due to this pandemic and the social distancing norms that we, uh, you know, ought to follow. 
in order to protect us so this image also speaks about that uh, uh, so the evergreen forest now is designed or each tree has adopted itself to suit the situation or the condition of the forest there are few emergent tall trees which grow up and they are slender in nature then the middle ones have a spreaded canopy so that they can catch more an amount amount of light the tall ones are slender so that they don't block more light and then you have herbs and shrubs growing on the ground and that is how that entire uh, you know layering of an evergreen forest happens now this we are discussing because there are various aspects of design that we need to learn and uh, you know understand before we get into proper architecture that is man made so i am starting this presentation with various uh, examples of uh, what kind of evolution or adapt uh, adaptation by natural selection has happened in nature now uh, you can clearly uh, say that this is in an evergreen forest and this is a forest somewhere in a cold mountainous regions right so uh, we identify those conical shapes shape uh, you know uh, linear trees with that kind of forest and not with a evergreen forest so each region has its own language as far as nature is concerned so here in this case the coniferous trees that you saw they have needle shaped leaves instead of the flat uh, broad leaves that you find in the evergreen forest wherein they want to catch maximum amount of sunlight and uh, there is ample amount of rain and moisture in the air so they don't have any problem of water whereas in coniferous or the mountainous regions we normally see that the temperatures fall down to very low or uh, uh you know uh, degrees and uh, there is snowfall and there is also scarcity of water in a way so these leaves are designed in such a way that snow doesn't catch up on the leaves leaves remain open for osmosis to happen with the sunlight and uh, air qualities so that is again one of the qualities that a tree has adopted with time in order to uh you know survive in the given circumstances and situations now this third example again is of a banyan tree now this is found in a tropical zone and normally not in forests but it itself is a huge uh, canopy which can uh, you know cover up huge areas now since it is spreading horizontally it needs some kind of a support you cannot keep on going you know cantilevering out from that central trunk system so these branches that they uh, that extend towards the horizontal uh, plane they need to be supported so then they, it started developing those aerial root kind of system which is primarily to support the branches right now as opposed to that if we see a, a palm tree that is found on the coastal regions now in coastal regions uh, the soil quality is uh, you know sandy and loamy so it's very coarse and it doesn't bind so a tree has to hold on for better grip so there is this linear uh, pattern of palm tree which has tap roots that go deep within the soil or the ground so that it can hold on and then these uh, there is no branching out happening you know it's just a single slender trunk that goes up and then you have lightweight leaves that are coming out of it so basically this is to adopt itself to the kind of tidal winds that it gets you know when when we are at the junction of water body and land there is going to be a lot of wind currents uh, that happen so in order to adopt itself and you know uh, to keep itself steady in those winds this is the kind of design it has evolved now we come to the hot and dry region then cactus is one of the examples right all these things are nothing new you all might have studied maybe in 5th 6th 7th standard of your schooling in biology or geography right but then uh, here we are talking it with reference to design now here uh, again there is water shortage and there is intense uh, sunlight and heat coming in right so uh, the way this has evolved is that the shoot 
turns into a, a fleshy kind of water retaining stem which has chlorophyll and the leaves are replaced by thorns and if you see there are these uh, the green uh, fleshy stem that you see has a flattened vertical surface so basically the idea is that in evergreen forest you had uh, leaves that were arranged horizontally with reference to sun so that sunlight could hit perpendicular uh, to the leaves and they could uh, take care of osmosis in this case sunlight is so harsh that the stem the green stem which uh, you know takes care of osmosis is basically placed vertical so that sunlight starts hitting incident to that uh, surface and you know the heat gain is reduced in these trees and then again uh, you have uh, those fleshy uh, stems which retain waters instead of you know losing or evaporating through leaves and this is about aquatic plants that we see you know they are uh, adapted to the uh, underwater currents that they are there and that's how it functions now above water when we talk about uh, then this is a giant lily pod you know uh, there is this stem that is rooted at the bottom or the base of the lake and there is a stem that comes out till the top and then you have a leaf on the surface of water now uh, it basically felt the need to increase the surface area of the leaf particularly in order to take care of osmosis right and uh, you know uh, to generate oxygen and produce food for itself so it had to be wider and in order to have a wider leaf it had to support itself right so there is this structural system that developed over it and this structural system is uh, so efficient that in this image you see a baby has been placed on that lily pod and it is stable so that is the kind of uh, strength that this particular leaf has developed over time now this particular uh, species or group of uh, plant is basically amphibian of the plant kingdom when we say amphibian we are talking about uh, animal that can survive in water and on land so this is somewhere amphibian kind of uh, evolution that you see in plant kingdom now it is normally it is a mangrove for those who don't know mangroves are normally found on the edge of water in the marshy lands and uh, they play a very important role of you know protecting the land from uh, rising water levels so uh, right now there was a very heated debate going on in assam about uh, you know depletion of these mangroves uh, across the brahmaputra river and how that has affected uh, you know entire cities or districts because of the flooding uh, waters of brahmaputra so that is the role of mangroves and that is how they have adopted you know they they have these aerial roots which at times mangroves also keep floating and changing their position in order to adapt to the changing level of water and the kind of environment that they need so this is another kind uh, so in order to just summarize the way uh, plant kingdom has evolved uh, there is a very popular theory which all of you might be aware of that is a uh, phenomenon of natural selection which was uh, probably uh, coined by uh, charles darwin in his uh, theory of evolution uh, and that theory is very helpful for us as architects you know uh, as architects we need to be uh, jack of all trades you know you may be master of one of the things but you need to be jack of all trades anything you are asked you should have information about may it be biology geography society psychology all of these are some way uh, you know going to help you in your understanding towards the way you design and the kind of community that we create for people to live in now that essentially defines the uh, direction in which our society will head towards right so uh, this is just a small example of how nature 
has evolved in plant kingdom with time similarly in animal kingdom there are many creatures in various regions that you see and how they have adopted over time you know to suit the situations and conditions i don't think there is much need to elaborate on this but for example you know the way giraffe has evolved that large neck or how uh, the camel has that hump that stores water or how polar bears or you know animals found in a polar region they have thick skin and fur to protect them from the cold so all of these are evident and we all know about it uh, just to state one example uh, you know in the cat family you will see a large variety of uh, creatures you know, starting from the domestic cat to cheetahs jaguars leopards tiger lions uh, you know snow leopard snow tiger so all of these uh, they belong or they have evolved from a same gene pool but then each one of them has evolved differently based on the region they were uh, you know habitating in now the same story uh, is about humans humans as we all know have evolved from apes right but uh, you know somewhere in that process of natural selection maybe in in this image if you see in that stage 4 or 5 somewhere we messed up you know we started uh, you know uh, making decisions for protecting ourselves from nature instead of you know having that patience of uh, evolving ourselves as creatures to adapt to those conditions or situations we started using our intelligence or intellect to protect ourselves right and that is where we lost that uh, process of natural selection which we see successful uh, being successful in uh, plant kingdom and animal kingdom humans somehow didn't uh, go for correct process of natural selections and that's why they failed that is what i feel and that essentially triggers the need of architecture that i'll come on come towards in the uh, coming few slides but what we need to keep in mind is that we uh, made a wrong decision somewhere in that process of natural selection and uh, we fucked up basically right so where did that mistake happen you know that that is what we need to understand so this image probably speaks a lot you know it might be a small cartoon or a graphic for people and uh, you know but i take this as a very serious image this is uh, an image i take as uh, that of an early man who started clothing itself to protect from climate and who started uh, building tools in order to protect itself from uh, external attacks and that is where we lost in natural selection any animal or any plant didn't have this intellect to develop or start clothing itself or start using tools and hence they were uh, able to go ahead with natural selection processes which could protect themselves from the existing situations maybe from external attacks or from the climatic conditions or the geographic or the topographic conditions that natural selection process helped them in becoming able to deal with those situations and not needing any external help but this is where we started making mistake and then this gets into beautification mode where we start beautifying each thing and when you start beautifying there is some kind of attraction that happens and this attraction leads to this and it ends up this way right so then getting back to the question why architecture right now humans as i told you they started clothing themselves and then they started uh, building tools that could protect them right now in that process what happened is previously in the paleolithic age we were uh, hunters we kept moving from place to place right so then this is the kind of habitat that is the shelter that we first chose 
uh, we started habitating the caves. We had fire, we had tools, and we started protecting ourselves from climatic conditions and uh, wild animals by living in caves. So that is the first kind of shelter that we find uh, in human uh, history. Now, uh, as and when, you know, uh, that hunter kind of a mindset started changing to a gatherer kind of a mindset because of agriculture that they were supposed, they were able to do. By the time we were in the late Paleolithic age, humans started, uh, you know, growing their own food. So agriculture gave way or gave the need for them to settle down at a place. So that is where we start building our own homes. Because when we talk about agriculture, it had to be uh, near water bodies, essentially a river. And around the river, you had flat plain areas wherein you had agriculture. So where would you find a cave on a flat plain? You can have caves in mountainous or hilly regions. You cannot have a cave. So that is when humans, they early humans, they started building their own shelter. Initially, it was from twigs, branches, stones, and they started covering it with animal leather or anything they found around that could protect them, right? And so that is that is uh, where we uh, started architecture in two sense. So these were the first kind of structures that we built. And then in the Neolithic age, when we started taming animals, we, uh, you know, grew our own food. We started weaving our own clothes and along with that, building materials and building techniques and the way we build our shelters kept changing, needs kept changing because then we were uh, making or growing food that had to be stored. And all those kind of functions led us to need of various different kind of structures that we have today. Right. So essentially, when we talk about why architecture, these four are the primary reasons. That is what I feel. This is a very personalized opinion. You can have a say on this. But on a personal opinion, I feel these four were the categories that were responsible for us to design uh, buildings or structures for us to reside in it or to take care of various functions and needs that we have. First being protecting from climatic conditions, protecting from wild animals, defining territories. Now we had to define territories because uh, you know when we started agriculture, we had that need of defining our territory. Otherwise, there would be conflicts. You know, uh, this land, am I supposed to uh, grow my crops or somebody else is supposed to? So that conflicts, in order to avoid, we started defining that territory. And then once we started habitating as singular family, we felt the need of privacy. Previously, we never felt the need of privacy, right? And as in when this kept evolving, we felt the need of architect to be there. Correct. So this is what my understanding is of architecture. So primarily, those were the reasons why architecture started. Now, in order to be a professional, as a professional architect to build and to design buildings that can define our society, what are the ingredients? that we need right so first is the drawing skills we all know about it there is this uh, drawing skills that is needed you need technical abilities in order to understand each material its spans its structure everything so those technical abilities you need you need to innovate yourself you know even humans in those paleolithic or neolithic case they were innovating from caves they started building their own shelters that is an innovation for them you know, in order uh, to make those tools is an innovation, to weave cloth is an innovation. So an architect essentially needs to innovate. And there is this aesthetic sensibility that has to be developed within ourselves. We may not all be, uh, you know, art, but you can always train yourself to be aesthetically correct. Then uh, listening ability. 
now when we talk about listening ability there is a very uh, you know convincing metaphor that i uh, have come across which says that uh, god has given us one tongue and two ears so you know you should listen more than you talk that is what it essentially means the more you listen the more you understand the more you absorb and the better you can produce so listening abilities and along with that obviously communication skills that is a must in today's world wherein you know uh, and this communication skill is not only about the oratory skills in today's world we need to be well versed with the means various means of communication uh, today social media is playing a very huge role in our society uh, that it, it is influencing each and every person in multiple ways so how to positively use that social media or how to talk to various kinds of people how to uh, you know get your ideas to words to to people how so all of these are included in the communication skills then there is uh, a need of collaboration because this is not a one man army we have multiple stakeholders and entities involved when when we talk about architecture right so there is a owner or a builder or a developer who is spending money there is architect who is designing there is structural engineer there are service consultants there are people who are going to execute your designs on site and they have a very different kind of literary level than you have there is a difference in intellect that you as a professional will have from the person who is investing his money so you you need to be uh, very efficient in the way you collaborate and try to function with all of them so a kind of teamwork is needed right and then there is this vision that is needed in the first slide as i showed the way archigram started uh, you know uh, igniting our minds or ideas through those simple images of various designs so that is the kind of vision that is needed to take forward architecture we can always keep uh, making caves we could have you know kept making those uh, shelters from twigs and stones with animal leather that was possible but then we kept evolving so that is the kind of vision that is needed obviously there is there has to be passion without passion you will have no vision no innovation everything loses so this essentially is like salt in food it gives a uh, taste to each and every ingredient then there is competitive spirit that is needed and especially in 21st century till the 20th century we always saw uh, egoistic egoistic kind of architects who you know uh, were very egoistic to say you know you you all will be studying or you all would have studied that in modern architecture you had singular entities of architects who were very egoistic and they could uh, work and uh, you know, could be successful but in today's competitive world wherein you know if one mistake you make and there are 10000 options available in market so that competitive positive kind of competitive spirit to survive is necessary you got to be nature lover now this i did not elaborate at all we are living in an era which is facing the results of global warming and ozone layer depletion and we are seeing all kinds of uh, natural uh, disasters happening around us so nature lover is must according to uh, un survey uh, global warming uh, is result of various kinds of uh human interventions that we are doing and out of all those interventions infrastructure industry is uh you know contributing around 33% of global warming and that directly comes into our hands it is what we are designing is getting executed and that is creating global warming and that is 33% one third of the problem if we see around one third of the problem can be solved if we become responsible designers right 
so you got to love your nature around which is uh, you know supporting you in a way and you have to be resourceful you know uh, you have to be resourceful in terms of ideas in terms of knowledge in terms of uh, skills that you have so every everywhere you have to have resources agar ye nahi chala to wo wo nahi chala to kuch aur so that is the kind of resourcefulness that is needed in us so these are uh, probably the 12 uh, elements i feel are necessary to shape each architect now the next question that comes to mind is how to develop these skills so i could just broadly divide these into three different categories and let's try to then understand how those categories can be uh, imbibed in us so these are broadly three categories that i see first category includes drawing skills technical abilities and aesthetic sensibility that can be achieved through theoretical studies and uh, the subjects that you study at the undergraduate level those are in a way consciously or unconsciously developing you uh, or developing these abilities in you right so these are the things that come with theoretical understandings innovation love for nature passion these come by self development nobody can you know teach you how to innovate nobody can teach you how to be passionate nobody can teach you how to love nature it is only you who can do that for yourself so these are the abilities that i feel you need to develop in yourself and that has to be done by yourself now the other six qualities that you see are all taken care of by the design studios that we uh, have uh, designed in our curriculum a five year long curriculum has a lot of weightage maybe 60 70% of the weightage is given to the design studios or your own design ideas and how you uh, bring forward those ideas communicate your ideas and uh, convince people for what you think so that in a way uh, uh, gives you that uh, platform wherein you can start you know inculcating all these qualities in yourself so design studios uh, we might take it very lightly even i as a student uh, you know wasn't that uh, aware about how it will it will eventually shape me as a professional but after being in profession profession for last 8 to 9 years i have understood how those studios have uh, developed me as a professional who can stand in market right so uh, this is broadly what shapes an architect right uh, now what to build again and how to build so i again uh, you know i am a nature lover in true sense so i again went back to nature to look for examples if uh, other animals or creatures if they are building something how are they doing it and what are the uh hidden qualities that we find in them so uh, this for example is a very uh, common bird that we that is uncommon today but then it's a very common bird this is called a household sparrow house sparrow right and it builds its own nest now this might appear to be like a very ordinary kind of uh, a shelter or a uh abode to live in but if you see very carefully the bird has brought each and every twig you know and the way it has weaved its nest in order to have that internal space which can hold the kind of activities it needs to do you know it has to uh, 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 lay eggs it, uh, the eggs hatch the babies need to be protected in that shelter they should fall out now even the location of that nest is uh, is decided so strategically now this nest uh, is very uh, the the way it is placed placed is very interestingly decided you know in monsoons there will not be a single drop of rain that falls into the nest though it has no covering over it 
but then how does that ability of selecting that particular place wherein with that arrangement of leaves and branches over that particular spot is such that not a single drop of rain falls into the nest so these are the kind of qualities that we find you know you see various kinds of nests being built around now this is a sociable kind of a weaver bird community where they live again in a colony it's essentially a colony with individual homes right and this is one of uh, a very interesting kind of a bird found normally in forests of australia this is called gardener bird and look at the way that bird has uh, built that conical kind of a structure with that open passage way and the way it has arranged its food and various things around it's so beautifully done so here we talk about aesthetics as well as the functionality of the building now this is uh, again a very interesting feature uh, this is called beaver and it it has that two uh, very prominent kind of tooth that help help it in uh, you know uh, felling the trees so they cut down the trees they take or choose various twigs and branches and first thing they do is to build that dam they build a dam out of those branches and twigs in order to retain that water you know and why does it do that i'll get back to that so this is the kind of dam that they build no uh, and mind well they don't have cement they don't have lime they don't have steel they don't have any uh, simulation softwares in order to understand how to retain that quantity of water what is the load of water uh, you know all these things they don't have whereas we are fortunate enough to have them but still they manage to hold that entire lake by a bunch of branches that they have cut themselves now once they do that this is an amphibian kind of an animal it can survive in water as well as on land so in order to protect itself from the uh, terrestrial animals it builds a lodge that you see on the right side uh, now that lodge is designed or placed in such a way that the creature has to come from the land pass from under water and get into that lodge so only a animal that can survive under water and on land can get into this neither the aquatic animal can get into that lodge nor a terrestrial animal can get into that lodge so so look at the way they use their interlact and the surrounding uh, situations to their benefit so those are the kind of things that we need to learn so this is one of those lodges that they have designed now this is a colony of wasp this is a bee colony again a very uh, you know uh, nicely designed uh, colony with hierarchy uh, that exists in it various functions are allotted various uh, regions in this particular colony and those regions have a specific quality that they carry this is a paper wasp again this this entire sheets of paper that you are seeing is made by that insect by excretion and that is how it creates these structures these are very interesting structures i am just including one one images you all can uh, you know browse internet and get to know various other things so one of my favorite uh, creature is a spider so the way it builds its nest talks volumes of its understanding you know the way uh, its geometry is designed to suit the anthropometry of the spider or the way uh, you know they span those large uh, lengths of spaces it's amazing so see the kind of complexity in the structure that they have that Uh, you know bottom textile kind of a surface and that how that is held together by those vertical angular and multiple kind of support systems that they have it's amazing how they build it you know and they are building it in nature they aren't 
creating the situation for themselves it is uh, what is existing in nature and they use that situation to build a nest for themselves now when i was looking in for spiders this is a very uh, interesting kind of an experiment that was done by uh, you know a few scientists in nasa wherein they uh, influenced that spider with various kinds of drugs lsd marijuana sleeping pill caffeine benzedril so and and then they saw how their abilities to build a nest or a spider web was being affected because of influence of that particular drug in their system and, and this image speaks about it you know nobody has to explain anything and uh, the way, the reason i kept this is that we also need to understand how various external elements that we feed into our system can affect the way we think and we perform you know so that's this is a very important study as far as you know our performance is concerned as architects as well now this is an ant hill uh this is again one of the very intriguing kind of uh you know uh, structure found in nature you know, uh, just try to imagine that this uh, ant hills are 6 to 8 meters high and look at the size of that ant which has built this you know we today we take pride when we build a 840 meter high burj khalifa and we make it a uh, show out of it if you try to you know scale this up to human scale you know the way ant is there and then that human being you know 1 mm is to 2 meters and then scale this up you will see a 2000 or 2500 meter high structure that an ant is building without any knowledge of structure any material knowledge nothing and these are perfectly ventilated internal colonies or uh, voids that you have are very precisely interconnected where which connection they want where they want to block a connection everything is pre decided even temperatures of the internal spaces are regulated hot air there is a provision for that hot air to rise and go out there is a provision for cool air to come in so these are exceptional element of uh, you know architecture that we find in nature and look at the beauty of this and uh, this particular image i chose because there is a very stark kind of resemblance to one of the structures that we have built as humans you know, which is this cinderella uh, palace that you find in disneyland no this there is so much similarity you know yeah obviously in the abstract manner but look at the way both the structures they resemble to each other and here we talk about the gothic style and this and that but who knows what disney might have been inspired by antil you never know right so there is infinite possibility from where you can get inspired and what you can do now uh, uh, what this is a scientist uh, who uh, an australian scientist and uh, he decided to you know uh, open up the top of that ant hill and pour alu molten aluminum into that so what happened is all those passages tunnels colonies they got filled with this aluminum and it got solidified and then he removed those dirts so essentially what you see right now is the negative space or the voids that are there in the ant hill and look at the beauty and the way in which they are all interconnected the image on the left talks about ant hill and the one on the right is about the termites there is the difference of function and the way they uh, you know live their lives in that colony so that is why the designs are different but look at the way uh, you know intricacy in which they have created spaces of various quality and kinds for themselves now so uh, what do we learn from uh, nature as architects right 
so essentially the two driving forces according to me are morphometry that is uh, the study of measurements of various kinds of shapes animals creatures topography geography anything so that is called morphometry and the second thing is a context that is there for them now morphometry uh, when we study we get to know about you know uh, the kind of forms the kind of spaces the scale of spaces the proportion of spaces that each organism uh, you know uh, creates based on its own size and dimensions and the kind of function it has to perform right and that can be later on translated into our understanding of anthropometry that is essentially about uh, human beings right and when we talk about context we are talking about the availability of materials the kind of climate that we see in that particular region the topography the surroundings that is there and you respond to those things so that's so basically it is morphometry and context that defines the architecture that we find in nature and along with those two things we see function and utility as a very important part or integral part of you know because basically that structure is being built for some reason so that function or the utility of that particular space or volume that you created has to be taken care of so uh, if you ask me to simplify simplify architecture anthropometry context and function if you deal with these three things you are done with a lot of uh, things in architecture right so as i said when we talk about morphometry in human beings it is essentially anthropometry right now when we talk about measurements it is mathematics right and in order to understand uh, you know measurements in humans or in nature uh, there is a very uh, sure shot kind of a formula that is there right now um, i don't know how many of you are aware about this term but this we have studied somewhere in 7th or 8th standard which is fibonacci sequence you know uh, it is basically derived from the pascal's triangle uh this also we have studied at school level but you know how uh, now what we are trying to uh, do right now is how we use that uh, academic knowledge at school level and how we use it to understand or uh, you know to further our understanding of design right so this is basically a fibonacci sequence so to summarize it every next number is the sum total of previous two numbers as simple as that no and now you all might be thinking uh, how is this even relevant in you know understanding or designing uh, with our understanding of anthropometry right this sequence when transformed into squares gives us a very uh, different kind of a curve that we call as the golden spiral no uh, if you if you uh, see here is my arrow visible someone yes, yes sir. sir yeah okay so the first number that you see in this sequence is that white square that you see and the second number is that second square that you see a third number 2 is now 2 by 2 grid here then it's 3 by 3 then it's 5 by 5 then it's 8 by 8 13 by 13 21 by 21 and all you do is you start making a arc in that square a diagonal arc that in, that forms uh in the square right and then what you get is a golden spiral now i'll get back to that but that is one of the things that we uh, extract out of that fibonacci sequence second thing that you see here is the same uh, sequence is represented in a very different way you know one part of 21 size then two parts of 8 and 3 sizes so that 
essentially that sequence that you see here here is transformed into this kind of a geometry now this geometry uh, we call as a fractal geometry a golden spiral and fractal geometry when they are brought together that can explain you each and every design decision taken in nature not by humans taken in nature any damn object in nature or any built forms in nature if you try to study it will narrow down to golden spiral and the fractal geometry now the golden ratio as they call it is 1 is to 1.618 and this goes on because it's an uh, infinite kind of a number it essentially is derived from this uh, particular diagram wherein if this is side a then this is a plus b and a plus b by a gives you that fraction and that in a way is what will help you in understanding the human proportions now the small m that you see here is that one and the capital m that you see is 1.618 so that is the kind of ratio or proportion that we find at each level of human being you know may it be may it be at this external uh, division from your belly button to the top and belly button to the bottom or you get down to that small level of you know uh, your length of your forehead to the length of your uh, skull so from at every level you will find that golden ratio or proportion is what defines human anthropometry hmm. now this becomes very complex for us to use as an architect so there were two geniuses who made it simpler for us you know first one being leonardo da vinci and his vitruvian man you can study more about it how he tries to create that square which is the span and the height so essentially what he is trying to say is that when you uh, you know uh, stretch your arms horizontally and you measure it that is the uh, equivalent to your height right and and then that circle that he has formed which has a center at belly button and then all activities that we perform our hands our legs they occupy only that much amount of space right so this is a very simple explanation that i'm trying to give right now there is a lot more to decipher from these uh, you know coded kind of diagrams leonardo was known for his coded uh, uh, way of representation and even today there are people researching on it and i'm trying to discover new things out of every every why is mona lisa considered to be so uh, interesting even today and no other uh, painting of even michelangelo or uh, you know any any painter but mona lisa is even today interesting a lot of people because there are things hidden in it there are hidden uh, geometries there are hidden uh, elements of design which makes it very uh, you know uh, each person curious about you know to know more so that is one thing uh, that is the first interpretation of anthropometry that is found uh, done by an architect the second one uh, that interests me again is uh, the modular man of le corbusier now again here you see again that fractal geometry uh, you know that sequence of fibonacci series and how those divided portions add up to give human proportions and then this is the abstracted version that you see on the right side or the same now how does this help in building architecture right that is also a very important question for us to learn how does that particular diagram or those uh, irrelevant kind of numbers help us in designing right so let's take this up as a scale which was designed by corbusier now now he tries to create a kind of grid of that fibonacci sequence that is found right and he uh, extracts those various kinds of shapes 
and puts them together to form a kind of a geometry right that gives him a lot of options of grids and that essentially transforms into the facade of the buildings that he does the proportions of those facades when done with this understanding of anthropometry each volumetric space will most definitely function exceptionally well for which it is designed right and then eventually the facade that is designed is as per golden ratio and as per scientific uh, knowledge or researches it has been found out that any thing that appeals to human eye is essentially in golden ratio right so this is ought to appeal to human eye right now that was about external facade now uh, that modular man has another diagram which is again done by carbuzier wherein he tries to show various activities postures positions of human being and how various dimensions work out now those are transformed into his internal residential planning so he starts with those two plain cuboids of two story 14 meter deep structures and starts to articulate them and then he ends with this and then that kind of understanding is translated into an architectural section and that is then multiplied at various levels to achieve what he has done here right so that is how anthropometry can help us in our understanding towards the kind of spaces that we build and how those can be made more effective second one is form space and order right okay now for to explain that i have taken example of uh, kala kendra of jaipur now this is that internal court space that you see you know you can see the kind of scale of this space and those blank solid walls and yet they don't dominate in this space you know those those walls that you see are around 10 meters high by around 50 55 meters wide so that solid wall if you try to make today and you you know with no punctures and nothing none of your faculty is is going to accept that you know, the first thing that they'll question is hey, itna bada solid wall kya karega? how will it respond to the person standing in front of it so this is a very important lesson you know it's such a large solid wall and yet it does not dominate in this composition a person standing anywhere uska nazar kabhi wo wall par nahi jayega there are so many elements around that its his attention is divided right and the second reason why this we see is the way that vertical plane has been uh, you know transformed into that horizontal surface the way the, the person has articulated charles coria is the architect for it and the way he has articulated that solid wall by you know creating those kind of uh, stepped uh, sitting spaces that you find normally in step wells that is what dilutes the you know dominance of those walls and again in this central kind of a space if you observe uh, you know carefully uh, when there is a one person coming into this space he or she will always try to occupy the corner you know because we want that kind of uh, you know space that uh, makes us cozy and we don't want to stand in space you know wherein we constantly feel koi yahan se dekh raha hai wahan se dekh raha hai so we want to take a corner right so ye a kind of gathering space hai and then you get into those internal spaces built forms which are very cozy and of the human scale so which which uh, abhi ye, if you see in this image a person those two people talking they have taken the center stage and still they feel comfortable enough to communicate whereas in this image if you see those single single people if 
you know they are trying to take those corners ye center mein jo bhi baithe hain they are seated because they are performing so they are forced to do it but otherwise you will not find a person standing here or a person standing there or a person standing here as an individual you know we'll always try to take a corner but in this kind of uh, this scale of a space uh, you know the the position or the place that you occupy as humans changes and that is the kind of understanding we need to have now these are places where various human activities need to be done so the spaces are articulated and designed in such a way that there is that coziness that is needed for humans to feel comfortable right and then there is a connection there is a connection to the next space that is established at this level right and then uh, if you see in the image on the right uh, light takes over you know uh, there is this very uh, uh, famous saying of uh, louis kahn uh, wherein he says that uh, you know sun never knew its value till it fell on a wall so a built element is what is defining light it it says volumes about his understanding about how light works in architecture so uh, you know light takes over this space and it creates various kinds of moods within a same kind of connected space uh, this is the overall plan and section of that particular build form that you see and look at the way things have been balanced you know in in section if you see there is that open court space that we have and then there is this volume that goes up and then there is this uh, spherical dome which comes in here and the way he the architect has tried to balance each element and you know look at the kind of internal space that the person is trying to create in this administrative kind of area you know the scale of this space and look at the kind of space is created for exhibition you now when you enter in from this side then there is this uh, human kind of scale space small space which opens out in this large volume for exhibition wherein a person wants you to you know look up because there is that huge painting on the door so the person wants you to look up so then that is the kind of interpretation he has for it. and then again it gets into that smaller space then there is this double height volume which connects this internal space to this large external volume it doesn't give you a shock so then there is that double height space you know which creates a kind of connection between the two then again you get into this uh, human kind of a space a small space which opens out into an articulated court space which has this element which again takes your uh, eye up and then you get into a smaller space so that is the kind of form space and order that we are talking about right and then the way he articulates the external volumes and the open spaces and the semi covered spaces right so uh, that was about uh, the anthropometry and form space and order those are essentially the two studios that you do at the first and the second semester level first you try to create an your understanding about human scale and then you try to understand how spaces can be uh, you know designed and placed together to form an interesting kind of a built form which interests the people and which gives comfort to the inhabitants along with that function is always there as an underlined facility that is being built for uh, performing a particular function so function is there so right so first trade that we study is anthropometry second is form space and order now when we talk about context as stated previously we're talking about material climate topography and surroundings right so these four elements can again be studied in detail like for example uh, exploring if we start taking a brick as the built form or a, build, a building material then essentially we are talking about modularity bricks come in modules so we are talking about how we can play with modularity of that particular building element and explore and then when we come to concrete it is more about plasticity 
or moldability of that particular building material so your design changes drastically right from what you saw saw in brick a brick cannot do what concrete can do and a concrete cannot do what brick can do right and then when we come to steel it is about honest expression of your stresses tensions and bending moments right so steel is again a very different material and then its expression has to change stone again has a very different kind of physical quality so it is uh, so the design uh, also changes along with that material particularly you know these are uh, you know the image on the right that you see right top is of kailash temple which is the largest monolithic structure built so it is it has been carved out of a single stone you know you're not assembling it whereas on that center what you see is the adala jwal now that has been assembled together to kind create that kind of a space and see the way light quality changes as you ascend down that step there and then those boulders that you see on the top left are of the stone hens now imagine people building this in those times without any cranes even today we do not have cranes that can lift such big boulders these may be 200 300 ton you know each boulder might weigh that much and then they have transported this from a quarry maybe 100 150 kilometers away so that is an amazing kind of achievement that they have done look at pyramids look at that scale can you build that scale today no and then this uh, temple right now uh, wood as another building material again the uh, the way you express that material changes bamboo again it has its own properties the way you respond to those properties again gives you a very different kind of a design interpretation right so similar can be talked about climate i think i am running out of time i have shifted over time so uh, you know a lot can be similarly can be explained about climate about topography how it affects your design how it should affect your design physical context built forms or natural elements around your site function and utility how all these factors they affect all of these are covered up in probably the first five semesters of your design studios right and that gives you a clear idea of what to design where to design how to design right now next thing that is important after designing is deliberate deliberation you know you need to discuss your design you need to communicate your ideas to another person listen to his inputs and refine it so that is a very important stage which is taken care of by the kind of uh, academic structure that we have designed for design studios you know there are daily discussions with your faculties there are discussions that happen uh, with your classmates then there are those presentation juries that happen so that is the stage where you deliberate right and then there is that important portion of how to execute there is design there is uh, deliberation and refinement of that design and then comes execution and that is what we essentially learn in the six semester probably in the working drawing studios as to how should we make drawings that can communicate our ideas to that layman illiterate person who is working and you know uh, physically uh, you know attaining or uh, executing that particular design right so phase 1 is learning which is defined in those six semesters that is what i feel right because in any other course graduation is of six years right uh six semesters sorry three years so uh, even in architecture i always say this that once you are through with your first three years you should be treated as a professional and you should be capable of being an 
acting and uh, you know presenting yourself as a professional you are not a student anymore once you clear that six semester right so phase 2 is what i call as expression so 7th 8th 9th semester is where you start expressing and is where you start building your own identity as an architect or as a designer right so those are the semesters where you consolidate all your understanding of previous semesters and just focus on developing your own language of expressing the way you design and then it culminates as the final year thesis and you are an architect now as an architect what are the various professional avenues i'll take only 5 10 minutes more uh is that okay sir yes kintan continue continue don't okay. worry okay okay uh okay so uh, now once you are an architect what is the kind of avenue that you have right so obviously an architect can do architecture but along with that there are various things that a person can do architect can do conservation he he or she can take up criticism or journalism as an avenue he can take up building information modeling which is a very upcoming kind of a field that you have you can do landscape design you can do product design you can do project management you can do sustainable consultancy you can do urban design you can do urban planning and so on and so forth you know the way an a uh, student is uh, you know trained for these five years i am sure and i am very confident that he or she if that person has taken those five years of uh, learning very seriously and done it with interest that person is capable of doing or undertaking any kind of uh, professional work that he or she wants to do usme usko he doesn't need to you know uh, learn anything more he is a good manager he is a good communicator he is a good designer he can be a very good writer he can do anything he wants to do right so this is about the avenues that you have and what are the various capacities in which you can work right so you can uh, be an employee with any of these avenues you know you can take up any one of those from the list in the left and put it or combine it with the one on the right and you will be that right so uh, an employee those that is always possible you can be a freelancer you can be a proprietor and start your own firm but obviously as a fresher it is always advised to take four or five years of experience in the field you want to perform and then start up with uh, your own practice or an independent kind of a design practice you can be a consultant who is linked with other people and is uh, doing a project you can get into academics a very beautiful way to give back to the society from where you have learned you can be a research scholar you can be a critic you can be an editor you can be anything right so normally uh, you will never find an architect you know uh, if you have a batch of say 80 students then you know hardly 5 10 of them are going to practice hardcore architecture the other 70 are doing very good in their careers and lives but they choose to do what they want to do right like for example uh, ratan tata an architect he uh, he needs no introduction uh, i'm sure you all would be you know uh, listening to pink floyd now they were architects again right so there are so many examples of people who have done architecture and they have excelled in something else you now because architecture essentially uh, develops those basic uh trades that are necessary for you as a professional to get into anything architecture ka training hi itna difficult hai to be very honest it has been stated that architectural training is one of the toughest those five years are one of the toughest that list having law medicine uh you know chartered accountancy every every said professional is in that list but architecture tops that list 
so it is a very tough kind of a training that you get but then as it is said tougher the training the better are the fruits right so uh, so yeah that is probably my understanding of uh, what architecture is and what we what all we can do right uh, nothing happens unless you first dream that is how i'll want to end this presentation this is a uh, very uh, you know I, this is one of the images that i love this is sark institute of louis kahn and this image was taken uh, at the spring equinox and that perfect timing when sun was setting in and that is when the image has been taken and look at the beauty of human intervention you know it is in no way trying to hog on to that space that is there in nature it adds on to the value you know it frames that nature instead of you know framing your building your building is framing nature oh. So yeah, that is it. Thank you all, and we can have questions. Thank you so much, Kintan sir, for sharing all this. Us as students really needed such talk. Uh, and if I, if there are any questions from the audience, you can un unmute yourself and speak, or you can just write it down in chat box. I think this has removed the myth amongst the students that when they reach third year or fourth year, they think that they have become architects. They should be. That's what I was saying. Of hai ki nahi, that is debatable. But no, I. Oh, hai ki nahi ki baat kar raha hu. Myth ho raha hai maine. If it is with clear understanding, it is okay. Yeah. Ideally, that is the level when you should be equipped enough to. Uh, you know, handle yourself and present yourself as a professional, and not as a pampered baby for a student. Yeah, yeah. If they have gone gone through all the processes, what you have told, it is yeah. okay. We accept. So there is one question that I have right now. You know, uh, when we had this uh, conversation at Nasser's office. I wasn't sure of what to present and what to talk on because there are so many things we can keep talking on. But was this relevant? This is how yeah, I had interpreted. It was very relevant, but I was expecting a drawing from you, जो तुमने उस दिन बताया था for second year students. So both of you were some juries which has happened in. I just wanted to inspire and not demotivate. So I have an idea. So I have an idea. I just want to make a suggestion. <laughs> so we can do it in part two. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, inspiration can be in a very hard way also. Yeah, but then today's students they are very pampered, you know. So that how efficient would that harshness be? That is what. अभी कभी आइना दिखाओ तो लोगों को पसंद नहीं आता. So that is what we are trying to remove from this reality. Truly. Okay. See, I, remember, I remember Kintan's class. Eight hmm. thirty, the door used to get closed. <laughs> yeah. उसके बाद कोई बाहर अंदर नहीं आता था. When I think myself and Vignya was there in the class. Yes, sir. You both were there. <laughs> Maida, madam, Vignya. Maida, madam. We were sitting in the class on the opposite side. Yeah. Opposite. Yeah. yeah. Campus studio था. I remember those. I have one of the videos I shared it with Naya sir. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Movies. Jury ka. <laughs> But Kintan. Yeah. My God, I was really mesmerized. हम जो भी बोलते हैं, Kintan, you won't believe. I mean, my students would agree. Uh, we, whatever example, the way you explain importance of each subject, love to work, love to nature. Uh, I mean, we really try uh, in teaching, and you really add on, you add it to our uh, teaching. I really, I appreciate that. But Vidya Madam, after eight nine years, I know, I know that some of these students who are now there, they will be giving these type of webinars. Much better than this. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The other day, I was talking to one of my classmates, 
थोड़ा लेट आया थोड़ा काम में था बट एंड देन का स्लाइड देखा मैं वापस बुला लेंगे सर अभी तो ऑनलाइन ही है अभी भी हम उसको बॉदर कर सकते हैं नहीं नहीं दो साल के बाद अरे इट इज नॉट अ बॉदरेशन इन एनी वे इन फैक्ट आई एंजॉयड इन यू नो प्रिपेयरिंग दिस नो आई 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 एक्चुअली स्टार्टेड ब्रेनस्टॉर्मिंग टू नो यू नो व्हाट ऑल कैन हाउ हाउ टू समराइज इट मुझे ये सब पता था बट इट वाज वेरी लेटेंट लेटेंटली प्रेजेंट इट सर की लिख दी है टाइम हम लोग क्या बोलेंगे तो बोलेगा नायर सर तो पागल है इतना सब थोड़ी काम करो ये आपने बताया ना तो अच्छा हो गया आई थिंक स्टूडेंट्स हैव अंडरस्टूड इट बेटर मेरे पास सर कभी-कभी ना आईडिया आ जाए मोटिवेशन वी वर हैविंग व्हेन वी वर टॉकिंग अबाउट नासा कि हमको इतना काम करना पड़ेगा तो ही हमको प्रॉफिट मिलेगा नहीं 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 For me, it was a place to ex- escape from studios and submissions <laughs> and enjoy myself. No, no, but then today I have realized that if I had used that opportunity, uh, you know, in a very serious manner, it would have exposed me to a lot of things which happened later on. Maybe after graduation, I could expose myself to those things. But that is a very good platform, which which is underutilized by students, I would say. Sir, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Uh, Just to ask. In the, in the beginning, you told us about the floating cities and uh, the future cities. So, what are your thoughts on a uh, big for the initiative? What should what should be the initiative that we should take to develop such cities? Uh, As far as city planning or urban planning is concerned, that is what I'm trying to study. Right. So these two years, after if you ask this to me after two years, I'll be in a better place to you know uh, uh, tell or share my ideas. Right now, they might be very raw, immature, and may not make sense. So that is why I have taken up this as a master's degree after eight years of professional experience, because that is where I feel I am lacking. 
of my understanding on a larger scale because when we talk about the city uh, you know we there are so many more uh, issues that get added up to our understanding of architecture and along with that there is very important thing that we need to uh, you know understand is that even as architects we are trying to influence the society our built forms you know uh, affect the psychology of the person who is residing in it it affects the thought process it affects the way that built form interacts with the surrounding built forms and that in a way forms the city so it starts from architecture but it has to end at the city level and hence that understanding of the city level is necessary to uh, you know uh, do architecture in a very effective and in a very positive manner so that we further uh, you know the society somewhere we have stopped developing as humans wo maine to bola na evolution theory that adds up hum jo over smart log hai na they are not uh, good for themselves not for society so we are over smart kind of creatures in this nature who are you know we are doomed if we keep thinking this way we are doomed definitely we might cease uh, to exist somewhere and uh, sir one more uh, what are your perceptions on cities with artificial intelligence see any technology if uh, it is used with understanding then it adds value you know uh, a smartphone is smart and is good no doubt in it but then it depends on how you use it you know people have spoiled their lives careers everything because of that phone and there are people who have built their careers with that phone a person committed suicide because of that pressure that he felt uh, happening on that social media i'm um, um, i i'm talking about sushant singh rajput yes i don't know if it was suicide or murder or whatever let people solve it but he was pressurized and the pressure was there because of social media and that has taken up such a big part in our lives because of mobile so any technology used uh, wisely is good if not it affects you in a adverse manner thank you sir chintan can i ask you one question also sure uh, first of all thank you and wonderful presentation and I, i think students will motivate will be motivated after this talk and do something incredibly in the present studio uh, first of all i would like to congratulate you also with, because you also ranked first in your all india gate examination which all we are also proud about you and i would be very happy if you share some of the uh, your preparation method or maybe some kind of a uh, few wordings about that how these students also can prepare for them prepare for this competitive exam it is very much needed see to be very uh, honest at this platform you know sviit like my second home so to be honest on this platform people don't uh, believe when i say but uh, nair sir is a witness to that <laughs> that uh, i was teaching uh, in a college taking three studios at a time so i was taking around 250 300 students and along with that i never had any time to prepare for it this is a very honest uh, uh, you know it is just uh, you know the way uh, you are self at undergraduate level when you were part sal jo nahi hai and the way i tried to absorb whatever was coming from any direction and then it been forced in that those eight years of perfection practice and the last two years that uh, you know i had uh, of teaching 
that help me in you know reviving those things honestly i uh, you know i have bought books for preparing for gate 6 months before exam and i opened it on a friday and i had exam on sunday so that is the only pre preparation i did so undergraduate level pe dhyan se pad lo so then these are piece of cake also i remember kaha you know 12th mein usne tuitions nahi kare the yes yeah i never went to any tuitions he got i'm here Huh, yeah. I'm hearing, I'm hearing that uh, there are tuition classes available even for architecture students. Structure and there are people who uh, do studios for you. You know, the students are resorting to all these things, but then they later on realize that in their place, they have done a lot of work. That's right. Yeah. Sir, there is a question from one of the attendees. Bridges, sir, Bridges, sir is saying in ancient time people had the integrity to build such extraordinary structures. Uh, in twenty first century, we also we are also amazed with that. And he asks why we are not able to do such massive and extraordinary uh, structure that were built by ancient human beings. And what is different now? And what is missing? And what is the gap in thinking process? probably we have as i said we were smart there and we are over smart today we have lost all sensibility or sensitivity towards uh, you know uh, very important uh, characteristics or qualities that should be there as an architect if you see any of those ancient structures you know you may take now acropolis the parthenon or the pantheon in the rome or you know all those ancient structures there was a very uh, honest expression of you know relationship of that built form with the function with the occupants with the surrounding all that sensitivity is lost today i uh, you know uh, at this platform i cannot say a few things but taha uh, knows very clearly when we meet and when we talk and when we discuss you are on whatsapp groups the way we criticize uh, various uh, designs and you know buildings coming up today and uh, how they are in a way you know uh, we this pandemic could have been avoided that is the power of architecture but today we have lost those sensibilities of uh, how to design a uh, you know habitable space and what are the qualities a house will never be contaminated if it is nicely cross ventilated and if it is nicely lit but today there is no importance of cross ventilation and uh, natural daylight because we have air conditioning systems so windows are just to see samne wali khidki mein it has lost the purpose of ventilation and light so those are the kind of sensitivities that we need to develop in self you see here if you see major majority of my portion was talking about build forms for structures in nature may it be natural selection in plants or you know build forms of birds and insects they are much more sensitive and smarter than us in understanding and living in sync with uh, you know the natural environment and that is what gives that uh, you know character of eternity to any build form you look at the uh, you know build forms of uh, louis kahn any structure i'm sure that will stand even after 100 years and people will still visit those structures because he is sensitive towards light and ventilation so these are five elements of nature once you start respecting those five elements and the built form which reflects or uh, respects those five elements that will stay on forever simple as that uh, 
one more nikhil sir is asking how can we represent or interpret our culture of literature in terms of architecture all right nikhil we can talk about it later on we have had a lot of discussions already well that becomes a very uh, specific question usko class mein bata sakte hain to usko ha bhai usko kar lenge this is ho jayega don't worry bhakti ma'am is asking how can architecture help this pandemic How can अब इस पे तो बहुत सारे वेबिनार्स और डिबेट्स हो ही गए हैं. There's a lot of material available. Uh, how can architects help this pandemic? अच्छा आप एक एक चीज ये समझ लो. How is built form uh, you know aiding to spread of pandemic? How is the current built form aiding to the spreading of this pandemic? वो समझ लिया तो you can always Use that as a tool to prevent it. Simple as that. Now, we'll see technical details. Me, so, going to that, that can be another lecture we can organize. In these last four months, I have attended at least seven or eight uh, webinar series is when uh, you know uh, experts were talking about post-pandemic architecture. So, yeah. any other questions if so i finally thank vigna ma'am for giving me this opportunity and for conducting this uh, webinar i request i request vigna ma'am to deliver the vote of thanks and conclude the webinar sure thank you architect pinkan sir for sharing your valuable thank you ma'am thanks a lot i am pinkan only No architect, no shah. So we have to be, have to be. Yes, very rightly said by you that nature has the adaptability to uh, the nature to the change with for its survival, right? So there is a famous quote by Byron Calcifier to ad to adapt is to go ahead. I mean, you go on adapting to move ahead, right? And every point explained by you, right, from the twelve elements which makes an architect a versatile person. to the six fibonacci series and the examples were really uh, very explanatory and uh, in a nutshell i would say you made our work <laughs> it was excellently explained by you uh, i am thankful to all the attendees for being the part of the webinar i would extend my gratitude to our principal professor sailesh nayar sir to be with us to be with us to encourage to give us the actually all our webinars on the or on the series of our academics only yes. either it is either it is urban or it is landscape okay. or it is conservation even the alumni yes. series will be based on that only yes. so i would i would i would appeal to all the students whoever is still there and they uh, try and attend even in previous webinar i saw students are uh, even to the community there should be uh, you know complete participation of students there is something to learn from everyone even yeah, from that is it's i would say yeah that is why i asked muskan because she is in the students council okay. now you should try to motivate your classmates friends juniors okay they should in uh, you know they compulsorily attend it so one of the topic one of the point what uh, vidyanath told is that only 
participation exploration so how can that thing happen it can happen only through these medias this is one of the media very okay. so i hope in the next coming time we will be having more alumnis who will be representing our webinars because this is the alumni webinars series so all alumni will be participating in this so we will be present over here and fortunately and i am happy that all three were my students when i was teaching nikulai <laughs> bharat and kinta uh, <laughs> i can expect that another 8 years down the line either muskan or anybody else will be <laughs> step up with us yes yes sir and i will be, i will be sitting like waiter sir retired <laughs> <laughs> so happy raksha bandhan to all of you and happy eid i i think everybody will be in the festive mood but come back to the classes on tuesday Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you.